Hey guys, Ramsey here. Welcome to another video. Today we have a double header. And the uh, first part of the double header is going to be The Last of the Halls, part three. Well, uh, this is probably more like The Last of the Halls, part 10, but uh, we're not going to go there. We're going to call this The Last of the Halls, part three, because this is from the great Armando the Fair. And Armando the Fair, um, he uh, very kindly put together a package for me, and uh, I did pay for these. But as usual, he will usually throw in something that I have never smelled or some freebies. Uh, so, uh, you know, people like Armando and I've got another haul coming from Hari. Very, very kind uh, subscribers to my channel. They keep me well stocked with new things to talk about and, um, you know, uh, able to get my nose on many new fragrances or samples or bottles or, you know, just... Um, uh, stuff that they're selling out of their collection and they're giving it to me at a very fair price, cheaper than what they could maybe get if they threw it on eBay and waited for someone to pay top dollar. They're keeping it in the community and I very greatly appreciate that. Uh, it means a lot. It means a lot to the channel. I have years and years of content that I could talk about uh, based on stuff that bottles I need to do reviews on, samples I haven't gotten to yet, and it's all thanks to you. So before we really get started, a thank you. A big thank you. So let's see what we have in here. Let me uh, get out the handy dandy unboxing knife. Everyone's favorite. The unboxing knife. There'll probably be another package coming in the next couple of days uh, from Hari. And then we're going to have a break from the halls. So, so yes. But um, some of this stuff I just, you know, it's hard to say no. When, uh, when it's stuff that you've been looking for and... The price is extremely fair. It's hard to say, hard to say no. Very hard to say no uh, when you're a collector too. And some of this stuff is is getting rarer and rarer and harder to find. Okay, so let's get started. First of all, let's open the, uh, what I think is the freebie first. I'm guessing this is the freebie. Aha, uh -huh. it is the freebie. And what are you? Look, has its own little package. What are you, my friend? You are, ah, pure distance. That's right. I think this came in a, um, I think this came in a blind sniff video. So this is pure distance. Uh, Shaduna? I think it's Shaduna is how you pronounce this. And this obviously is not going to stand up. You put it upside down. Is that how it's supposed to No, It won't stand up upside down either. I guess it's just going to have to lay down. Um, but I actually talked about this. If you watched my blind sniff video, you know that this is something that I talked about uh, on the blind sniff, but this will give me even more juice to do a full review one day. And this is very, very full. So awesome stuff. You know, Pure Distance is an expensive brand. They, um, they make one of my favorite, they made one of my favorite leathers of all time. They have since um, gone away from, from making Pure Distance M. They reformulated it, and apparently the reformulation was not that great. But um, Shaduna is... Let me see if I can remember who did this. Shaduna. Um, 2016. Ah, yes, it was Cecile Zerokian. I thought it was. Benzoin, Bulgarian Rose, Musk, Tangerine, Amber Clove, Frankincense, Geranium, Lemon, Patchouli, Tonka Bean, Aldehydes, Myrrh, Vanilla, Black Currant, and Vetiver. So... Pure Distance, uh, Shaduna, a master perfume, a master perfume. Um, and then we also have a mini, or well, a, a seven and a half mil of uh, a rare discontinued fragrance. And um, let's see, this is a fragrance that has been actually on my radar for a while. This is a fragrance called Omar Sharif Pour Homme. Are you guys familiar with this one? Omar Sharif Pour Homme. Um, Parfums Omar Sharif. How's that for a little bit of a throwback? Short ingredient list. Very few people talk about this. Um, this is a, this is sort of like an oriental fragrance from what I know about it. It's heavy, it's thick, it's rich. And I know that um, Omar Sharif Pour Femme is something that my brother Russian Adam 
talked about on one of our interviews. So uh, I've had a little bit of a habit of trying to knock these minis out, you know, knock a review out very quickly um, because I've seen bad things happen to minis. They spill, they evaporate, I decant it, I lose the decant. So I, I, I bet you I'll get to this a review of uh, Omar Sharif Poron very, very soon. So thank you. Thank you, Armando. It's awesome, man. Great stuff for the channel. Really good stuff for the channel. And, you know, I bet you if you look for Omar Sharif Poron, you would find that uh, there are just not very many videos on it. There's just, you know, these type of fragrances just don't get love in FragCom. And so th that's the type of, um, that is the type of uh, content that I want to do. Stuff that's not very accessible, you know, whenever you look for these fragrances. It's disappointing when, you know, especially if you think this came out in 1992, uh, it's discontinued, but there are many people that probably still love this fragrance. And the fact that nobody talks about it, there's very few videos on it, can be um, a little disappointing. So that's kind of where I want to come in and, and change things. Okay, so let's get started with, uh, I think I know what this one is. I'm, I'm going by, I'm going by touch here. I'm going by, by, uh, by, by, you know, what I think the bottle feels like. So I think I know which one this is. Let's see, once we open it up, if, if I am correct. Ah. Uh, okay. What do we have? What do we have? What do we have? What do we have? Let's see. Aha, it is. I was correct. Okay, so this is actually an early 2000s bottle um, of a uh, Hermes fragrance from the Hermes Ons line. And this is called Ombre Narguilé. And Ombre Narguilé uh, is a Jean-Claude Elena. And... Um, so the cap actually is different on the early 2000 bottles. According to Armando, you can see that the cap is different than the newer ones. They've kind of upgraded the, uh, the cap. And so on these older ones, uh, this is what the cap looks like. On the inside, on the newer ones, it actually says Hermes and stuff like that. I think from 2010 onward, but from like 2000 to 2010, these are what the really old bottles look like. And you can, there's sort of the, uh, the bottom for you batch code lovers. Uh, but anyways, Ombre Narguilé is um, a little bit of a adventure for me to sort of step out on. This, this is 2004 release. And um, I'm stepping out on a limb on this one because I usually do not like sweet fragrances. And this is basically uh, a sweet fragrance. This is a... Um, this is a winter fragrance for sure, and it's ambery, obviously, but, um, according to base notes, so it's amber, and you have some, um, spicy oriental, almost gourmand-like notes in there, so you get, um, a little bit of roasted sesame, which is an interesting note, I will say, and, um... And let's see what Base Notes has to say. Okay. Amber, tobacco, fruit, honey, spices. Amber, the Western expression of Eastern fragrances, has a warm, sensual, enveloping, almost carnal smell. I wanted to imbue th this idea of amber with the memory of the East, I love by recreating the ambiance of those lively places where tobacco blended with the smells of fruit, honey, and spices is smoked in narguilés or water pipes and where swirls of smoke diffuse a sweet sense of intoxication. So definitely a colder weather fragrance if you're into that kind of thing, if you're into the season, the seasonality of perfume. Um, and Almost like this uh, apple, this sweet apple pie, smoky, ambery, tobacco-y, apple pie-like smell. But uh, for the winter, I'm sure it's going to be absolutely stunning. So, ombre narguilé. Very excited about that. Good stuff. Okay, so that takes care of one of the big boys. 
So the second one, uh, which one? Which one? Let's go with this one. What are you gonna be? What are you going to be indeed? It's always an adventure. Man, my unboxing night has seen some, it has seen some stuff, man. Trying to cut through some of this packaging. Ugh. Okay, here we go. So this. No, oh, I'm gonna have to cut this open. Come here, you. Okay, all right, here we go. So this is a rare treat because I have been looking for the cologne version of this fragrance for a long time. I actually own the um, more modern reformulated version that um, Francois de Machy did in 2018. And I've had it for a while and I like it, but it's not my favorite. And I was very curious to see how much better the old stuff is. So, so I have, I've had this one and this is actually the cologne version of Bois d'Argent. Um, I'm expecting big things from this. Rich Mitch said that this is so good, um, that he was able to hunt down a, uh, cologne version of Bois d'Argent. He's actually looking for a backup. And you can almost see the, the juice color difference. This is, there's going to be a huge difference between these two, I feel like. Um, Bois d'Argent came out originally in 2004. And the, ish, the uh, perfumer was uh, the great Anique Minardo. And uh, this fragrance is basically what inspired the whole Dior Homme aesthetic. So there's this... Um, you know, when you when you think about that Florentine iris that your ohm is known for with Ambrette, it's here. And so this also has things like uh, frankincense, Somalian myrrh, Indonesian patchouli, honey, amber, white musks, and leather. And um, yeah, I've got I've got very high hopes for this. So the original cologne version of Bois d'Argent. Now I'm just looking for the original. Um, I'm looking for the original Eau Noir cologne, which that's going to be very hard to find, but uh, you never know, you know. I was able to finally hunt down Bois d'Argent cologne. Now I need the um, the original Eau Noir cologne. That's on the list. And speaking of staying with Dior, we are going to stay with Dior. And this is an older... Uh, bottle before they switch the um, the cap to the uh, C and the D connected and so this is this is Queer Canage so this is uh, the older style bottle of Queer Canage in the 125 mil and I loved Queer Canage I ended up getting um, so I ended up getting um, a couple decants of this from Moudassir, and I absolutely loved it. I think this is one of uh, Francois de Machy's best works. I think it's actually very similar to a very expensive Roja Dove fragrance called Great Britain. And I have Great Britain right here. So Great Britain used to sell for one thousand seven hundred and fifty dollars uh, or pounds. I can't remember. Um, and they've since slashed the price by a thousand pounds. Now you can get it for seven hundred and fifty. Okay, but there's rumors it's being discontinued. Uh, there's rumors that's why the price was cut. Is that uh, it's being discontinued? But for me, you know, this is actually I think a little bit better than Queer Canage. Um, they play in the same sandbox, but this is very, very good for what it is. I mean, one of the best modern leather fragrances, in my opinion. It's got this, um, it's got this very purple iris color that pops into my head whenever I smell it. And, um, um, the note listing on 
on Quirkinage is, so it's a 2014 release, and this bottle is a 4Q01. I think this might be a 2014 bottle. Um, but it's Leather, Iris, Jasmine, Orange, Blossom, and Rose is the is the just official note listing. And this is Francois de Machy at his best. I mean, doing stuff like this is, um, I think, where he really was able to shine. This and Leather Oud are two of my absolute favorite absolute favorite uh, Privé line. Um, so I am I am absolutely stoked to have this. It is uh, it's a it's a pleasure. It's an honor. I love this stuff. Like I said, I have some decants, and um, um, if you like this style and, and you're willing to spend big money on a fragrance, uh, Great Britain is, is phenomenal. Oh, pleasure. Again, a pleasure to wear these type of fragrances. These are, as far as modern fragrances go, if you're going to force me to wear modern per perfumery, that's the kind of stuff that I want to wear. I love, I love these. Um, okay, so that is the last of the hauls, part three from the great Armando. Thank you for the freebies. Um, I promise Omar Sharif Porom and um, and uh, the Pure Distance Shaduna will get love. It'll get a full review at one point on the channel. So yes, good stuff. Thank you, Armando. Thank you, seriously. Okay, so let's talk about part two of the video. And part two of the video is this. And this is Elsha 1776 Cologne. Now, uh, Elsha 1776 Cologne all of a sudden started to get some headway in FragCom. And I have to give Jonathan 1970 um, a little bit of a shout out here because he did a video talking about he found this bottle. He didn't know how old it was. Uh, and... As soon as I heard it was a Russian leather, and as soon as I heard that uh, he thought it was a, a good fragrance, I was like, it's going on the wish list, right? But I couldn't really find a bottle. I didn't want to just buy a new one. I was kind of hoping to see if I could find an older one, um, and it, nothing ever came to fruition. And then, a couple months later, um, one of my perfume god people who wants to remain anonymous, he said, hey man, um, I, I see Elsha 1776 has been getting some Fragcom love. It is my scent of the day today, by the way. And um, he said, I want to send you some so you can talk about, or just so you can get to know it. He didn't say do a video, but I wanted to do a video because this could be my only chance to do a video because I don't have a bottle. And I, I don't know if I will get a bottle, but I will tell you right off the bat that this is full bottle worthy. And I will tell you right off the bat that this is what's called a Russian leather fragrance. And if you're not sure about Russian leather, um, you can go check out my... I have a video, actually if you just search Russian leather on YouTube, one of my video where it's the Spanish leather versus Russian leather versus modern leathers is very close to the top of that search list. And so in a nutshell, this is a Russian leather fragrance and that's the only note that's listed is Russian leather. If you go to Parfumo and look up uh, Elsha um, 1776, that's actually the only note that's, that's listed. And Elsha is an old American brand. So, um, you know, if you think about American brands from the past, Elsha falls into that category, if you will. Um, and so basically what happens whenever you spray uh, 1776, it starts off compared to some of the other Russian leathers, which I've shown before, but uh, for me, stuff like this, Del Oro Russian leather, uh, these are, these are fantastic. There's actually two of them. There's a Del Oro and there's a, uh, Del Oro Russian Leather 2. There's a Russian Leather 2 and there's a Russian Leather. And they're both phenomenal Russian Leathers. This is also an American brand, by the way. Del Oro. Uh, these were made in Long Beach. You can see right there. It says Long Beach, California. Cosmetic, Cosmetico. These were made, I think, in the 70s. Um, but there were these little Russian Leather houses that popped up and, I won't go through all of the um, background, but in a nutshell, uh, Russian leather cannot be trademarked as a name. Um, so that's why Chanel can have a Russian leather, Del Oro can have a Russian leather, Elsha can have a Russian leather, so forth and so on. And um, so uh, there's, a, there's a lot of different versions of this Russian leather style. 
Um, and so uh, one thing that one of the um, one of the commenters that I that I was when I was reading about the fragrance mentioned is that the the fragrance will remind you of the American style in perfume. And I and I know exactly what he means because if you've smelled previous American style fragrances, like if you've smelled stuff like um, um, Fine Cologne by Paul Sebastian or these other American houses from the past, for some reason they sort of give me this um, this archetype, right? of an American fashion house from way back when. And um, as a leather lover, this just absolutely hits home. So the first thing you notice when you smell this, when you compare it to other Russian leathers in uh, German, uh, it's known as uh, Yukden. So this is Kolnish Yukden by the House of Farina, one of the oldest houses. Um, I'm just showing you these because I have some experience with Russian leathers. None of them smell like Elsha 1776. I'll tell you that right now. So instantly, there is an advantage to uh, 1776 by Elsha in that it is unique. It is a unique take on a Russian leather to my nose. And what makes it so unique is it starts off a little bit powdery, cosmetic-y powdery. Um, however, it never loses that Russian leather, oily, sort of, um, you know, birchy background bit. The Russian leather DNA is, is the backbone of the scent, but when you first spray, it opens up extremely, um, very bright and powdery. And that bright powderiness, um, that bright powderiness lingers on with the fragrance. Um, it lingers on with the fragrance. It doesn't necessarily go away right away. Like it's not like a top note where you spray it 10, 15 seconds and it's gone. No. It is this, um, it is this, this sort of uh, intertwined powderiness with the Russian leather DNA, and you will get that. And and if you know the Russian leather kind of backbone, you'll pick it up. I've heard some people say that it's a barber shop take on a Russian leather. I don't know if I would go that far, but there is this talc powdery, you know, bit to it. So keep that in mind. Uh, if you don't like powdery fragrances, maybe go with one of the other takes on a Russian leather, like like this or this or something like this or even uh even chanel's uh queer um uh, sorry yeah queer de russie by uh, chanel is not as powdery as as this so um just something to keep in mind um and even though it's russian leather perfume i will tell you this even though it's a russian leather perfume uh i can almost see the american founding fathers sitting in um coffee shops, bars, churches, people's houses, you know, colluding. And I can see Washington and Adams and Jefferson and Hamilton and Franklin sitting in these old churches and bars and um, discussing the American Revolution, discussing what basically could have been a death sentence to them, right? They took a huge chance speaking out against the establishment at that time. I'm a huge fan of the Founding Fathers. Uh, I've read many of their biographies. I think they're brilliant men. And um, probably spinning in their graves with what's happening in this country now, but that's a conversation for a different time. But I say that because this fragrance, I'm going to talk about the way that it sort of makes me feel more than the notes. Um, uh, mostly because I don't know what the notes are. Uh, and, and so I can speculate, but I really don't know what the notes are. Um, and so I'm going to talk about sort of the way that uh, the scent makes me feel. Because when I smell this, uh, it really does smell like a, an America lost, a, a different time in American history. Uh, it smells like centuries ago. It smells like, um, you know, tall trees, clean air, houses built from hand, um, the town working together to come to some common goal. Uh, that's the feeling. And I can see sort of the men sitting around and maybe it's the powdery aspect and maybe when I think about what the men of old times, you know, let's say American Revolution War, maybe that powdered wig aesthetic sort of uh, sticks in my head and the powdered wig aesthetic, maybe from the powder that I get in the top of this, I'm reminded of those sort of men. I'm reminded of the, of the Founding Fathers. Um, and... Um, 
So even this extra powdery compared to most Russian leathers, you can still smell the Russian leather DNA in the background. And as it continues to dry, more and more of this oily, uh, almost papery birch. So, you know, birch, um, ta birch bark actually peels off, this, off of the uh, tree in what looks like papery little bits. If you've seen birch bark sort of peeling, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. So imagine this sort of papery birch smell with um, um, this oiliness. All Russian leather sort of has this oily bit to it. And here it's there, but it's in the background. This is a, um, this is a seven hour dry down, and this is a three and a half hour dry down right here. And it doesn't change a whole lot. It's not a big shape shifter or anything like that. Um, maybe a little bit of bergamot, um, this sort of blast of, 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 um, of bergamot in the top with uh, powder starts to maybe dry down a little bit and you get more and more of that, of that DNA kind of shining through. But um, a good visual description is if you've ever had a nice pair of shoes, right? Like a nice pair of dress shoes and you are supposed to, um, let's say, they're a leather type of shoe, right? Pick your leather, pick your favorite leather. And let's say you're supposed to keep it moist, and, and uh, many times people uh, will recommend that you put mink oil on those shoes because mink oil almost works like, uh, you know, the, the water just like bounces off of it. It's almost like putting rain -X on your window, right? That's what mink oil kind of uh, does to a good leather shoe. But if you've ever uh, put mink oil on your shoe so that the water runs off, think of the oiliness of the mink oil while you're sort of rubbing it into the leather. And that is the impression that the leather gives in my mind when I wear it. This, um, this powdery bit on top, but this very oily leather underneath uh, with, of course, that birch. And... Um, I'm a big fan of the way that uh, birch smells, and um, one of the reasons that uh, one of the reasons that leather fragrances are my favorite is they always associate with um, to me. I'm, I always associate leather fragrances with um, sort of um, beautiful times in your life. So, for example, if you've ever sat in like a beautiful sports car or a high-end car, you know, and you're sitting in something that has like Corinthian leather or something like that, you know, and um, that smell stays with me. Or if you've ever um, uh, sat in like an old plush chair, not something, mo not a modern leather, not, not a modern pleather chair, but a real old plush leather chair where it had craftsmanship. That's a good word for this fragrance. Maybe there's a craftsmanship to this scent. Um, of old that stays that stays with me or some expensive soft gloves you know imagine this very supple leather that fits your hand perfectly or um, a stylish pair of shoes or maybe like a high-end purse that your date is carrying with her or um, leather products or, um, even around other animals like for example a horse think about uh, a saddle and a skirt and latigos being near or around the horse that's saddled up. And the horse also has this animalic bit to it, right? So there's this, there's this animalic resemblance uh, of animals, but also, uh, obviously, if you go full grain leather, um, the animal itself that it came from, right? And uh, Elsha 1776 to me is, is so good that and I just love this style of fragrance. So just take, you know, you have to know your reviewer's taste too. That's the other thing. I could sit up here and talk about how much I love this, but if you hate leather fragrances, you probably won't like it. No matter how good I think it is, it's, it's not going to be for you. So as a leather lover, you have to take that in mind. I absolutely love leather fragrances. And um, so it's, I, I can almost imagine, like imagine you have a nice full grain piece of leather and imagine the imperfections that come of it. Because when you have a full grain piece of leather, any scars that the animal got in their life or imperfections uh, in the animal's skin or, you know, a, there's, a, there's a plethora of reasons why 
these brands have switched to pleather. People actually like the um, smoother, faker leather. They don't like feeling something that's coarse. They don't like feeling something that has imperfections. They don't, uh, nowadays, everything needs to be sort of mass produced in the same. And the full grain leather uh, is, if I get a piece and you get a piece, they're going to be completely different. You know, they're going to have their own little grooves and, and bits and pieces and all that stuff to them. And, um, you know, from scars the animals had or, or whatever it may be, just natural markings on the animal skin. So the, uh, the brilliance of this process that, that real Russian leather would create is basically, um, imagine you have a, like a leather boot, right? And you're trying to make it for, um, an, an entire army, right? How do you, how do you keep an army's boots to be both at the same time soft and supple and yet very hardy and durable? And that is where that whole Russian leather process came in. Uh, and, and that's why this, um, that's why this wave of, 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 of Russian leather, uh, mania almost swept Europe in, in the 1900s, um, in, in, in the, um, you know, in the other countries, once the, uh, once the, once the tales of the Russian army's leather kind of got out to the other countries in, in the 1800s and, and early 1900s, that's where you um, really started to see things like the, the uh, Queer de Russi cologne starting to come out. Guerlain put one out, Chanel put one out, so forth and so on. And Elsha's put one out as well, but I don't know exactly when this came out is, is, is the only issue for me. Um, but the key to it all, as any good Russian leather scent, is the birch. The birch sort of opens up the scent. It has this fieriness, almost this... Um, winter time, winter green. Um, there's almost this winter green, smoky, tar-like smell of birch, right? And um, it can be very warm and it can be tarry, but very leathery. And, um, you know, it can almost be reminiscent of like a wood fire sometimes even. And so you just imagine that odor, that birchiness, that oiliness, with the leather, now mixed with whatever Elsha did to try to set itself apart with that, um, you know, with that uh, um, powderiness, that cosmetic-y powderiness. Maybe there's even a little bit of iris in here. It sure smells high class. It does not smell cheap at all. It does not smell dated. It's I, I would have absolutely no problem um, wearing this, wearing it at all. Um, no problem at all. None. And... Um, so yes, this is, uh, for me, this is a winner. This is a full bottle. I mean, I, I would absolutely get a full bottle of this. If I could find an older bottle, uh, the reformulation bit worries me. That's the only thing. The reformulation bit worries me because I don't know what the new bottles are like. Um, and so because of that, I I really think I would prefer to go with an older with an older bottle if I could find it. Um, but, you know, it's, um, it definitely has this, um, it has this uh, distinction, it has this class to it. And maybe it's, you know, if you've heard the way that I talk about Chanel's Queer de Russie, Chanel's Queer de Russie always sort of uh, brings me back to a time when there were still people using the horse and, and buggy. But, Imagine like the Tsar getting in a, a, a horse and buggy carriage, right? An opulent carriage. And that carriage is going to have leather seats and all that stuff, right? That's the image, right? It's not just a regular person riding a horse or, or getting in a buggy. It's like royalty, right? That's what Chanel's Queer de Russie does to me. And it's that mixture of animalic and that Chanel class. Now, this does not have the Chanel pop to it. It doesn't have that Chanel pizzazz to it. Um, but there is still something old school elegant about this, like I said, but it's like, it's like, instead of being based on the Russian continent, we're on the American continent and we have our own set of histories that we go through and the revolution and the star spangled banner that those are like the things that pop in my head. Um, and so I, um, 
I like this. This is this is very good. It's a it's a buy for me. I love the smoky birch. I love the leathery aspect. The powderiness may put some people off, but um, for somebody who, let's say you're a fan of things like Shalimar, if you don't mind the powderiness of something like Shalimar, this could definitely be a buy for you. Um, this could definitely be a buy. But on the other hand, I could also see somebody spraying this and going, absolutely hell no. I can't deal with the powderiness. You may love some of these other Russian leathers that I mentioned earlier, and you may absolutely hate this. But for me, this encompasses enough of the Russian leather DNA, and it does its own thing. I've never smelled a Russian leather quite like this, that I would absolutely buy a bottle of this. But I, I would love to find a, you know, well-conditioned... Um, a well-conditioned older bottle, let's say. Um, if you've smelled sort of the powderiness of um, Creed's Royal English leather, you'll kind of have an idea of the sandbox that this plays in, by the way. They're completely different. This doesn't have the orange aspect that sort of runs down the middle. It doesn't have that Creed um, sandalwood, you know, ambergris thing in the base. This goes its own way. But uh, it'll give you an idea, um, that smoky, warm kind of thing. Um, you know, the, the, the birch tar in the base, the oiliness, uh, and then the cosmetic-y, um, you know, the, cos the cosmetic-y um, powderiness in the top. So yes, Elsha, 1776 is a winner. It is an absolute winner for me. So uh, I appreciate you watching the unboxing and the quick uh, first early impressions, if you will, on Elsha 1776. Thanks everyone for watching. If you have experience with this, I would love to hear it. Leave a comment, tell me what you think, and um, cheers guys, and I hope to catch you next time. Bye-bye.